2012. So I can start by telling you a little bit about our background and our history and how we came to be. So back in the mid 2000s, there was a community collaboration with the hospitals and other nonprofits in the city of Portland, all coming together to talk about how to best care and provide a medical home for the under and uninsured. And through that collaboration, there was an opportunity to be able to apply for a HRSA federally funded grant that provides health care to everyone regardless of their ability to pay. So they developed a 330E grant, applied for the funding, were denied the first time because there were so many um, applications, but then received funding in the second round. So the health center opened up as part of the city of Portland's Health and Human Services Department in 2009. Our first location was at 180 Park Ave in Portland. And through the years, we have uh, grown and we became our own nonprofit 501c3 in January of 2013. At the time, we had 35 employees, a $1 million budget, and two locations. So over the course of the next 10 years, we have grown to be a $20 million organization with approximately 180 employees and 14 locations. So we are uh, very fortunate here in Portland to be able to serve such a diverse population. There are over 30 languages spoken in the health center each and every month. And um, we have a high number of uninsured. We have a uh, health care for the homeless program. We also have many new Mainers who have moved here from other countries and um, come to the health center to be served as their medical home since we provide oral health, medical, um, mental health services, and a variety of other services to support our community. So our mission um, is to make sure that everyone in our community is provided high quality health care regardless of their ability to pay. So we had the opportunity and a very unique opportunity, which we we're really excited about, to be able to work with two of our community partners, Maine Medical Center and Preble Street, to develop a program around recuperative care services. In 2018, we began conversations about how we could take care of our patients, um, our mutual patients who have extended stays at the hospital and need uh, additional time to recover but have unstable housing or no housing, so have to stay in the hospital can be up to upwards of 12 weeks for their healing. And so this is the first one in the state of Maine and we were excited to be a partner because there is such a need in our community and over the years there's been such an increase in the number of homeless community members that we are serving, um, that this was a unique opportunity for us to be able to take care of our uh, patients from the beginning um, of when they're part of the medical home at Preble Street and help them through their healing process with the end goal and hoping that we could connect as many of our patients while they were healing at our recuperative care services that we could connect them to other case management, we could get them connected to food, to housing, and to other services, and take one step closer for each and every patient at trying to end homelessness. would have to say that we are really excited about 934 Congress Street and the collaboration. It has taken us almost five years, and through the pandemic, we had to pause for a bit. Um, but it has really been very successful between Maine Medical Center and Preble Street, both providing case management and medical case management and having the health center available for our, our patients. Over 60% of the patients who have left our services after healing since um, September through the end of January, 60% have been connected to some form of housing um, and have not uh, headed back out onto the street. So we are really excited about the accomplishments and are really grateful for the amazing team we have working at 934 Congress Street. 
And one of the most exciting pieces is to be having such an innovative program here in the state of Maine. Our recuperative care services at our 934 uh, Congress Street Health Center location is the first in the state of Maine. We're hoping to be able to share as the program continues to grow and we have more metrics to be able to share um, with others across the state uh, who may also be interested in beginning uh, such a program. My name is Courtney Fladson. I am a nurse practitioner and I work here at Greater Portland Health and I've been lucky enough to help lead this recuperative care program initiative for the past almost five years, which is pretty incredible. The recuperative care program is a partnership between GPH, Maine Medical Center, and Preble Street. We are a 15-bed freestanding recuperative care program. We provide a really high level of medical care. There is 24-7 clinical staff here on site. We have the ability to provide IV antibiotics. We're able to treat opioid use disorder with Suboxone and Methadone. We're really lucky to have such wonderful community partners that support those efforts. And within the space, we our clinical team is here on the first floor that, where we provide the clinical care. And on the second floor in the dormitory space, Preble Street is our essential partner that helps to support milieu management, case management, and really address some of those really detail-oriented challenges around obtaining an ID, social security cards, uh, work on housing, work on whatever the clients identify as their needs and goals. So we're really grateful to have Preble Street uh, as essential partners in this program. One of the reasons why I'm so excited about Greater Portland's Health Recuperative Care Program is that recuperative care is a, an essential piece of building a continuum of health care for people experiencing homelessness. For people who are unhoused, they end up spending twice as long in the hospital as the general population and often end up not completing treatment. And so they end up discharging early, returning to the street or the shelter, and often end up returning in the cycle of going back and forth to the hospital. Recuperative care is so amazing at helping to stabilize a clinical condition while also providing the unique availability of wraparound services where we can really do intensive case management to address those social drivers of health. And really, we want to end homelessness. That is part of our goal in this program. And we're really excited that up to this point, we can share that 60% of our patients have exited homelessness and entered into housing once they discharge from here. They've gone on to sober living, permanent supportive housing, or transitional housing. Uh, and, and we're really, that is one of our main goals, is to stabilize health and to address homelessness. Welcome to Greater Portland Health's Recuperative Care Program. I'm excited to show you this space, so come on in with me. So down here we have the clinic area. Um, this is our waiting room. Coming over and we have our conference room. And here, this is where we have our multidisciplinary team meetings, and this is where we can host groups or do other trainings for the staff. Right over here, we have our washers and dryers that the clients can use. They're able to come and do their own laundry. Um, all of our bathrooms are um, outfitted with doors that can open um, in both directions for safety. Uh, and we also have reverse motion detector sensors uh, as well, just for additional precautions. Our team is all busy working, but this is our team room. We have a really wonderful team partnered with Greater Portland Health clinical staff and Maine Med's Homeless Health Partners, our case management staff, and you'll hear more from Josh, one of the HHP uh, case managers. Come on over. So here is the nurse room. We have patients come and receive their medications. Come on in. This is where we store all the medicine, wound care supplies. One um, special feature of our program is that we support patients receiving IV antibiotics, which is rare. It's a really high level of recuperative care. 
Um, and so we store those IV antibiotics here. We're gonna go through this door here, and this will be the nurse treatment room. So this is where the nurses will meet with the clients and do their wound care and provide their IV antibiotics. And then come on over. We have two clinic rooms, which are really traditional primary care rooms. You can go ahead and see. We're going to just do our regular exams. And then in addition to our exam rooms, we have a room where our case managers or social workers can meet with the clients individually. Right here's our laboratory where we're able to draw labs on clients while they're here. So here we are in the second floor of the recuperative care program. This is where clients spend the majority of their time, where they sleep, they eat, and they have lots of varying um, community events and spend time together. So come on through. We have lockers here where guests can leave their belongings. Here we have the community space. Clients can eat and have coffee and watch TV and play games. We have a kitchen here and we are lucky enough to partner with Preble Street to receive meals three times a day. Our case managers work here where they work on milieu management and provide case management for the clients. Hello. Martin, can you introduce yourself? Let us Hi. know a little bit about your role here in the program. My name is Martin Chavis. I'm one of the first shift case managers, case workers here, and we provide assistance with the residents here with housing, obtaining social security cards, uh, anything dealing with benefit cards, and uh, sober living housing as well. That's great. Yes. What do you enjoy about working in the program? I enjoy being able to help the less fortunate people out here that's just coming out the hospital that does not have a place to stay. So we provide medical care and we also provide our counseling too as well. You all do a great job at milieu management and really supporting clients feel comfortable here. What is What are some of your strategies? How do you help folks feel comfortable in this space? Well, we try to let everybody know that they're in a safe place with unconditional positive regard, meaning that uh, we hold no judgment, we hold no type of uh, stereotyping, and we take them as they come and we deal with them as they are. Thank you so much, Brian. You're welcome. Uh, I'm Mama and I am pretty much of Portland area. Great. I'm Chris Sam and I'm from Portland. Yep. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to this recuperative care program. Um, for me, I um, had a crazy situation um, that wound up uh, with the uh, abscess rupture in my back. Um, it was a really bad. Uh, it was a really bad situation, um, and then I have an, a bacterial infection in my blood and um, an unidentifiable bacteria in my foot as well. And I kind of had the same situation. I had a bacterial infection in my blood that led to open heart surgery mm. and an infection in my foot where I had to have uh, multiple surgeries. Wow. Um, Mona, tell us a little bit about what your experience has been like in the recuperative care program. My experience here has been, has been overall like amazing um i'm glad to have this opportunity to um to be somewhere safe where i can recuperate and not have to worry about um my daily needs like when being out on the street um i've had some minimal setbacks um being here that have changed my outlook um about where i want to go and um what i want to do after i leave here just tell me a little bit about what your experience has been like in the recuperative care program. Me, I've been here for a long time, since the beginning, I guess. <laughs> so I've had a lot of uh, experience here. Um, 
I've had nothing but great experiences, really. All the staff here are great. Uh, they work hard do, helping and doing anything that we ask. So it's a great place to come and heal, um, safe place. And uh, if you come here, just expect to uh, be treated like a human being and, re and respected like a human being. Mm -hmm. Mona, what are some of the goals you've had for yourself within the program? Um, some of my goals um, are, one, um, to follow the program um, and do the best I can to, um, to get better. Um, and uh, so I, I struggle a little bit with looking at a uh, long term because um, just being on the streets, it kind of causes me some some anxiety. Um, but they've been really great dealing with that with me and helping me, um, you know, set some some, you know, short term goals for housing and, um, you know, and just uh, drug and alcohol recovery. Um, so I don't have a, a real huge plan going yet, as that's hard for me to do. Um, but we're we're they're um, they're working on it behind the scenes for me. Uh, goals was healing, um, being able to walk again, uh, my health getting better for sure, uh, and then setting up a goal to get into rehab when I left here and. I've, I've accomplished that, so I'm happy with it. Where are you going to be going from here? I'm going to Wellsprings up in Bangor as soon as I leave here. What kind of program is that? It's a uh, three to six month rehab uh, and patient rehab, so I'm kind of excited for that. It's going to be my first time doing it. For really working towards long term recovery? Yep. Yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, Mona, is there any, uh, anything else that you'd like to share? Um, it's a new program. It's definitely got um, some kinks that, that they're, they're working out. But overall, um, it's been a great experience. Um, I don't know what I would do without having this program. All I got to say is if, I, if it wasn't for this place, I wouldn't be here I would, today. I would have died. Yeah. yeah, these guys have saved my life. So. Take this chance that they're giving you and use the opportunity for it because they're great people. And I do want to say thank you guys very much for that. Yeah. Kind of emotional feeling right now. Okay, so from Greater Portland Health, we do have Robert Fulton, Medical Director for the Recuperative Care Program and Brittany Lachier, Director of Social Services. And also with me, I have Annie Nichols from COTS Recuperative Care in Petaluma, California. And she's gonna say a couple words while I try to switch from YouTube to slideshow. Hi, <laughs> hope all of you are having a great time. I certainly am. Um, I just wanted to mention that there, you're going to see um, some introduction here by Julia Gaines. And we had, she was supposed to be in the panel earlier this today, and we had a, um, a substitute, Brendan Cook. <laughs> so in, in spirit, um, I, I guess he was actually speaking along the same line that she would have done. And we're hoping that she'll feel better tomorrow and be here. So if you see her, say, hey, I saw you on the video and enjoyed it. So. Thanks, Annie. That wasn't enough time. <laughs> not, not enough time, okay. <laughs> so um, it tricked her because it is. It tricked me? Okay. So um, I have a shelter-based clinic from an FQHC in, embedded in a go. shelter. Here it is. Hi everybody, my name is Julia Gaines. I'm the Supportive Programs Manager here at COTS. 
COT stands for Committee on the Shelterless. We're here at Mary Isaac Center. This is our home base for COTS. We're located in Petaluma, California. Um, we have uh, an emergency 80 bed shelter here, as well as other programs such as supportive housing, um, rapid rehousing, rental assistance. And we also have Mary's Kitchen here that serves free meals every day to the community. About 60,000 meals served last year. Um, but of course, what's the newest, you know, one of the newest programs that we have is our recruitment of care unit. So I would love to take you upstairs and let's, let's go take a look. All right, so here we are on the second floor of Mary Isaac Center. Um, this is the home to a lot of our case management offices. This is a permanent supportive housing here right, right next behind me. And this is our recruitment of care unit. So let's go inside. I'd love to show you around. All right, come on in. So, oh, yeah. so our recuperative care unit is six beds, it's co-ed. Um, basically, recuperative care is also known as medical respite. It's used for people that are coming out of the hospital that are homeless. And where they would be discharging home, they don't have a home to discharge to. So recuperative care is a place for them to come, heal from illness or injury, perhaps they just had a surgery, and they just need a little extra time uh, before going down to the main shelter or wherever it is they're going next. Um, the hospitals are our partners, they're our funding partners uh, for this program, and uh, they, they, you know, this gives them a place for, to discharge their patients that are homeless um, and then don't have anywhere safe to go. Um, and it also helps with getting services here at Recuperative Care that you don't return to the ER as much because you learn how to be more self-sufficient and manage your own health care. So we got six beds here. Everyone has their own lockers. We give, we give them a couple lockers. Um, they can also store things underneath their bed or in their nightstand. Uh, when they arrive, we do a full intake procedure and it includes giving them towels. Their bed's made, we give them some toiletries as well. Leave them all their, our business cards so they can get a hold of us at any time. And uh, yeah, so people typically stay maybe anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months. Um, they have a varying levels of ability, but pretty much everyone needs to be independent with their ADLs, which is activities of daily living. So they need to be able to feed themselves and bathe themselves, get down, you know, get downstairs to have uh, dinner in the dining hall. Um, so they need to be fairly independent, manage their own meds, but we're here to help them with coordinating their health care and uh, you know, helping get their, pick up their medications, etc. Just to kind of give them a good start right when they get out of the hospital. So if you come this way, this is the office in here. There's a recuperative care specialist here seven days a week. Um, not that these people, you know, not that the guests here need to have, you know, supervision seven days a week, but it's nice to have someone here to be an assistant and to help them with whatever they need. Um, we have a medication fridge, this is for meds only, so if they have, um, you know, insulin for diabetes or anything else that needs to be refrigerated that's prescribed, uh, we can keep it in here. Um, small kitchenette area, although we don't allow food and recuperative care because it get, can get a little messy. Um, and then right behind you we have a couple cupboards filled to the brim with blankets, pillows, towels, a whole bunch of wound care supplies, vital signs equipment, um, just kind of whatever we need to keep people comfortable and monitor their health. So I'm in this way. We have an ADA compliant bathroom. Very exciting. <laughs> So, so it's pretty much a one person bathroom. We do have a shower that you can get in with a wheelchair, we have a bench, to, you know, just if someone can't stand for very long, large restroom stall and a couple sinks. Um, this just, it makes it easier, especially if someone has a wheelchair or a walker just to get around um, and, you know, do what they need to do in a comfortable, you know, spacious area. Hi, I'm Angeles Cruz, or Angie, and I'm one of the recuperative care specialists here at the Cots Mary Isaac Center Recuperative Care Unit. So the main purpose of Cots Recuperative Care is for patients to come and recover from a acute medical need that they may have. For example, they may have a wound or be recovering post-surgery. So if a client can recover from something acute within two weeks to max two months, which is the time period that we typically allow patients to stay based on their medical needs. If they are eligible in that sense, um, that's one of our main requirements. 
they um, are welcome to come to our program if we have the bed availability at the time. And so when an uh, intake is scheduled, they must come with two weeks supply of medications, a follow-up appointment with a primary care provider, home health if they need it, and a negative COVID test within 72 hours of the intake. And all those things are put in place to make sure that the patient is set up for success before they come from the hospital or skilled nursing facility. So our role is primarily as case managers. We do a lot of the healthcare related work, which is important in respite care, but our main role is case management. So while they're here after their intake, within a couple days, we do an individualized action plan. So what they would like to accomplish, what their goals are during their stay. And that is a holistic perspective on the person's well-being. So it's not only physical health, mental health, but it includes housing, finances, any legal needs, recovery, if that's something that they're interested in or participating in, etc. cetera. Uh, the stay, like I mentioned, can vary from two weeks to two months based on the individual's needs. So it's a quick time for some individuals. So we prioritize getting an ID if they need one, a social security card, setting up any kind of health, bene uh, health benefits and Medi-Cal, Medicaid, all those things as well as EBT, food stamps, uh, anything that they would primarily need in order to get set up for housing, which is the ultimate goal for our individuals. And while they're here, we do help assist them finding all their alternatives after the recuperative care stay. Most clients do go to, downstairs to our main emergency shelter, um, but that's not everyone's plan or not everyone's desire so we work with the clients to make sure that they ultimately have the final say of where they would like to go or where they would like to end up um, and we do give a warm handoff to the clients that end up downstairs making sure that the next case manager has all the documentation and knows the client as a whole and assist as necessary as well. So just because they leave our unit and go somewhere else doesn't mean that the connection doesn't end. We want to make sure that the clients have their success and are able to share that with us as well. All right, well, I am sitting here with Mr. James Kennedy. He is currently um, a client here at Mary Isaac Center in our recuperative care unit. Um, and I just wanted to introduce you to him and uh, you talk about his experience here. Hey, James. Hey, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks, God, for the letter that sponsored the show, so they let me in here to the people's up here on the floor, Mr. Juliet and Julian Winch and them. How they got me going to where I am right now. Before, when I first came in here, I couldn't even walk. So, that's a blessing. I couldn't stop on my own little two foot. Some little ladies had to really talk me around so you can say that who cares for people who don't care, they go above and out their way to get you there. Now I can walk, I can kick, I can run a little bit. And thanks God for that because I haven't found any other place to do what this place I've done or any other place to do what these ladies here have done for me. These three mm -hmm. ladies took me to hospitals, take me to doctors, and got me walking baby me just like a baby machine. And you can't ask for it no better than that. So let me talk a little bit about medical respite and why it works so well for our community and for our shelter. Um, our, our unit opened just about two years ago and since then we've it's been about 50 people that we've served um, in the last two years. Um, most of them have come through and gone down to the shelter. But you know, if they went straight to the shelter, they probably wouldn't, they probably would have ended up right back in the ER because they just weren't ready to, you know, to be in a congregate living environment. Um, they still needed assistance with medications and, and activities. And recuperative care just like provided like this, you know, kind of soft landing out of the hospital. Um, that gives people time just to, you know, to, to get their strength back and then, then they move on to whatever their next housing situation is. It's been an absolute game changer um, for our, our county, our community. Um, the hospital partners that fund this program have been very happy with um, the results in terms of, you know, people aren't returning right back, to, you know, going to the street and then returning to the ER 24, 48 hours later. They are, they're, they're staying out, they're learning how to you know, manage their own health care, get, you know, established with a primary care physician, um, pick up their meds, take them regularly. All these things that, that seem really simple to us um, are very complex for, for a houseless individual. Um, it's hard to get, get regular health care um, if you don't have a shelter. So um, 
this is you know, this has made a big difference in a lot of people's lives. Um, I <laughs> I would love to see us have many more beds than six. Six has made a big difference, but um, certainly if we had um, a larger space, that would be wonderful. Um, we are one of two respites in um, Sonoma County, but the only one in South County in Petaluma. So, um, you know, we work primarily with Providence Hospital, and uh, they really they would love to see more beds, more more spaces to discharge their patients too. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching today. It was such a pleasure to give you a tour through what I feel is just one of our most amazing programs here at COTS. Um, if you'd like some more information about our services and programs here, you can go to COTS.org. Um, if you have any questions about medical respite, our experience, and how it's you know helped our community, I would love to talk to you. You can reach me at recuperativecare at COTS.org. All right. Thank you. I'm Annie Nickel. I'm an FNP, Director of Homeless Services with the Petaluma Health Center. I started a clinic in a shelter almost 20 years ago. Um, I was invited in by the community to serve the folks that were staying at the shelter. Um, it was strictly a volunteer job um, for the first year until I realized I was going to go bankrupt or, <laughs> or crazy um, and uh, engaged a, the hospital system, the St. Joseph hospital system, to help fund um, this clinic here. So, you know, develop systems of oversight for, over that 24 hour period. So, as this program developed and we had a lot more or found a lot more collaboration with other entities in our county, um, home care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, all of those folks were invited in to help with the clients after hospital discharge. We worked with many community health centers um, and arranged appointments for follow up with them and uh, any additional services that those clients may need. And the staff continued to, to build and grow and hone their skills by, by identifying you know, problems that could occur and also solutions. Um, and we would meet weekly to discuss the clients, have a case management meeting about when was this person going to be able to maybe move down to the shelter or another option in the community for, for housing and hopefully not return people to the street or the emergency room or hospital. Great success with that because there's kindness, there's tenderness, there's organization that occurs here that helps people move them to the, move them forward in their life and their goals. Um, yeah. So my question is, um, you know, we have a main shelter downstairs um, how is the experience different in recuperative care for the clients as, as opposed to if they were in the main shelter? What, te what services are they on? Recuperative care and COTS and all of the systems that are present in this particular company um, are so supportive of, of clients. And it's truly the wraparound model that I would like to see across the country in every shelter so that we are touching people around their housing, their health care, their so other social needs, their behavioral health, that all of this is kind of segue into, um, into a, a broader whole person, or perhaps always there's been a lack of follow-up care for those that are unhoused and have been hospitalized. You know, I mean, sometimes the only option in the past was returning people to the street, perhaps sometimes when they really weren't ready to go or keep them in the hospital for a very expensive um, stay that wasn't really addressing all of those social needs. Those social needs are addressed in this, in this company, in this situation, um, which is really, really helpful and keeps people from returning back to the hospital. It's prevention. Our, expand, our plan to expand to a 20 bed unit is absolutely awesome. Um, I'm a, a meeting with the hospital systems every single week and the biggest concern is where can people go we don't have enough um, places for people to go and how can we prevent the return to um, homelessness and that's difficult without a lot of help a lot of, a lot of direction and people that understand the population 
and uh, great supportive uh, staff. Um, Bill Hess, who was the COO at the time, um, was really, really helpful, and he was great with the tech and helping with the forms. We you know, figured out a fax system, a confidential fax system, and we started meeting with the different hospitals, um, just talking about what we what we could handle here. Um, and that worked for a number of years um, until there was a change in administration and you know part of the, some of the people that were helping with the recovery area had moved on um, about 2007 the end of 2017 2018 we started having discussions again about having a recuperative care and there was also some funds were garnered and some help from hospital systems and a new area was built upstairs on the second floor of this shelter. So we ended up with a great room and again six beds and a beautiful bathroom um, and opened in the beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. And my colleague and good friend Julia Gaines was hired um, and she was in charge of this recuperative area. Um, unfortunately, uh, let's see, was it February or March of 2020, the big C came on board mm -hmm. here. COVID was mm -hmm. everywhere. So our lovely six bed unit um, had to be transformed to a three bed unit obviously cutting down on those referrals from hospitals. Um, but it gave us also time to really develop the idea of recuperative care within a shelter. So one of, one of the things that we, um, we did, we always, we would work as a team looking at those referrals and looking at what was gonna work best for the patient and you know, whether or not they could do their ADLs, what type of care did they need, well, since we didn't have 24 hour direct oversight. There were all, there was always somebody here 24 seven working at Petaluma Health Center and also doing a little moonlighting with St. Joseph Health System, who were, had a mission to support um, the community and particularly those that were unhoused. So with some, some funding and a grant, we expanded our relationship with the hospital system and years down the line when uh, the Affordable Care Act rolled out, we were able to have some sustainable funds from um, the Kettleman Health Center. And here we are today, growing, <laughs> loving what we do, expanding all of those services and creating, creating lots of relationships within the community that are supportive. Sorry to end the music soon. Um, great. Okay. Thank you so much for watching those videos um, and getting to see a couple different sites. Who wishes that their program had that much capacity? I know I would have really loved that. Um, on a call that we had that was planning for this, um, Robert and Brittany talked about some specific relationships that they've established with substance use programs within the community. And I'm wondering, it just felt like really uh, something particular to highlight right now that I'm wondering if you two would care to share about to start the questions off. Um, so I think one of the unique things about our program is a relationship we have with one of the local methadone clinics. 65% um, of our patients are on MAT for opioid use disorder, and about 50% are on methadone, um, which creates a lot of logistics, obviously. Uh, transportation um, being the biggest one, because we're an outpatient clinic. So we've been really fortunate in um, a partnership with a methadone clinic, and at this point they kind of treat and view us as a correctional facility where they deliver methadone to us weekly. So our patients who, um, like everybody's here, are pretty uh, sick and, 
healing, recuperating, they're, they're having to avoid the daily or weekly um, trips that they were doing uh, early when we first opened. Um, so that was, I think that's maybe what you were yeah. asking about. But yeah, I yeah. think that that is like a really particular model and that's yeah. very cool and a cool thing to share. And then Annie, when we were talking earlier, you really highlighted some um, recreational and other kinds of like uh, programs that you have that I'm wondering if you could speak about a little bit and then maybe we could try to get some questions going for the last couple of minutes. Yeah, so um, when I mentioned wraparound services, we are so happy to have a supportive service provider who invites people on walks, nature walks, um, has an art class, does, um, leads a meditation group, leads a stress reduction group, um, pretty much jack of all trades, uh, oh, and qigong in the morning for anybody that's interested, and that includes both staff and residents. Um, and people can make individual appointments with him just, you know, kind of to talk about their life. Um, so that's super marvelous, I think. Um, and then we partner with a lot of other community members. As mentioned in the little video, you know, we have for, for the recuperative beds is we have um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, home nursing, and um, give them the space to work with clients individually. Um, we also have a sobriety is fun group and uh, <laughs> <laughs> along with some 12-step groups as well. But sobriety is fun. I mean, i not yes. necessarily involved in the sobriety part, but no, I didn't say that. Um, but, <laughs> but they go out and they bowl and they do and get smoothies and things like that. So there's lots, just lots of different activities going on in the same, you know, same time. There's a little garden out there. You can choose to garden. So when we talk about wraparound services, there's so many kinds that support the, the social aspect of people. Um, I have a clinic room that's right next door to the recuperative area. And we have some physicians, nurse practitioners coming in there. Um, we're also playing with like a mat program. We're doing suboxone refills and, uh, and helping to coordinate care um, with the goal is in continuing to improve your life and hopefully have a soft landing somewhere in the world that supports you in the same way that you get in this particular facility. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Are we... Any questions in the audience? Yes! <laughs> It just, yeah, it can be very short, you know, for somebody that just, you know, two to three days, they're just recovering, maybe they need some sutures removed, or just want to make sure all their body parts are working, and they're just nervous about going into the dorm. All of those things are available to the shelter people downstairs. So the dining room, we are on a second floor. The dining room is downstairs. So there, um, and the, the people that are in recuperative generally go down and eat there. Well, so that, they become accustomed to what's happening down there. And usually make some friends. You know, they're sitting at a table with people eating or sharing or listening to music. And so it's just, it's an integrative way to make it a little bit more comfortable um, for the people moving downstairs. Um, we do have some people with longer stays. We have um, a few people on palliative care that they're sort of at that point of, are they gonna get better? Or are they gonna go move on to hospice? And so they usually stay pretty close to home and are resting a lot. Um, and sometimes people get better and sometimes, you know, they're moving toward the end of life. Um, 
We're currently not doing hospice, um, but are really looking into doing that and coordinating with our hospital system. And when we expand to our 20 beds, we may be able to you know, provide that for the community. Thank you for that. Oh, we have a question from Julia Dobbins herself. <laughs> so earlier we were talking about IV meds and medical respite, yeah. and one of the questions was around um, harm reduction practices for folks who are IV drug users and, and needing <laughs> IV meds and medical respite and maybe having an open port and concerns around safety related to that. And I'd love to hear how Greater Portland Health manages that. What's the training for staff? and? Um, How's it going? <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, the, the topic of IV antibiotics, about half of our patients um, are on IV antibiotics and they have PICC lines. Um, and it's challenging as from the medical uh, perspective, um, there's kind of an inherent worry, even if it's an unfounded worry um, and there's I'm not an expert on the, the literature evidence out there, but there is kind of some ongoing research looking into is there really an increased risk of adverse um, events if, if people are injecting into their PICC lines or not. Um, and that has happened um, for some of our patients. And, um, and then patients have also not utilized their PICC line but are still using in other ways. Um, we attempt to mitigate the risk. Um, we educate our pa patients constantly about the, um, those risks. And we have some strong partnerships in the community that um, we lean on uh, when, uh, when there's that discomfort and we need to talk to somebody. Uh, people that kind of come at things with a very harm reduction perspective. So, um, so. I think that's super promising because that has been such a question in the field. Um, I know I have a question as well, just because this is our 101 day and we're really talking about starting a program and uh, what you need to do in the beginning. So maybe just knowing what you know now, if you could give a lesson learned or words of wisdom or something that you would have done differently that you could help another organization not have to learn themselves. Um, I'm sure we all maybe have one of those here, but. Yeah, I would say uh, pretty much everything we learned. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of them is just like, it's really important to have strong partners that you're with. Um, you know, I work at Preble Street and we're a social service agency. So like most of my experience is like in the jails and then shelters. And so coming into this space that is a, like a little bit more high barrier than what I'm used to um, has been challenging, but it's really nice to work with partners so that we can like hear each other out, pros and cons of whatnot. And just like knowing that you're never, like you don't have to be the expert in the room and being un uncomfortable with, or being comfortable with being uncomfortable and, and always working in the gray. There's never black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and that gray can kind of shift between different shades of gray from client-based and um, coming up with protocols and policies, um, being comfortable with consistently trying to um, form policies in, in different ways as the as the program is kind of moving forward and there's always a bunch of firsts and hiccups and stuff like that. Um, so just, just always being adaptive and um, yeah. I, I would say one of the, the, the best things about our partnership and I would encourage a lot of folks to um, kind of move forward with if you guys are thinking about opening up respite programs or you're in the beginning stages of it is, I'm um, trying to be as harm reduction and client and, and trauma informed as, as possible. Um, it really benefits the community and a lot of the reason why people don't want to stay in the hospital is because they're bored and, and because they can't get access to certain needs that they usually would have access to on the streets. Um, so just being uncomfortable with, or being comfortable again with the fact that this is a space that we really want people to stay at 
and sometimes that that obviously looks really different for everybody and um, there's there's a lot of unique challenges that come with always trying to find the balance between community need and individual need as far as substance use disorder goes. Um, so just being open with gaining different policies around harm reduction and, and being trauma informed around that. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, Annie. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, um, I think one of the things that, you know, probably I changed early on and like to teach is to welcome anytime somebody comes in. Thank them for showing up. Mm -hmm. And um, because I really do appreciate that, I think we all do, and there's so many. We, you, you never know who your next teacher will be. And my best teachers in the world have been the, the folks that I've worked with. Um, and if, when anything is uncomfortable, to really think about where did that discomfort come from? Is there something we could have done different? Were we really listening? Um, how could we do it better next time? And not, you know, not project ourselves on another human being. We're there to listen to their story. And, you know, at first, you, you get a little, maybe a little intimidated or don't know what to do or what to say, but just remember what you're there for. And the majority of that is listening and listening with your heart. And taking whatever lesson you learn and hopefully the person you're sitting with also is learning something. Thank you. Robert, you want anything? I, I just, I'd say be intentional about the space. Um, we, so for our program, we have a uh, large percentage of folks that are on the, with, that, with pick lines, have IV access. Um, so we've had to um, create a more restrictive um, uh, policies about coming and going, so patients really can't just go uh, as much as we'd love to allow that to happen. Um, it, uh, we wouldn't have community, we wouldn't have partnership buy-in, um, and, and and the hospital wouldn't be sending us their patients if we if we did that in Maine at least. Um, so uh, where I'm going with this is we don't have um, good outdoor space, so patients um, uh, can't go out and smoke. Um, a cigarette easily, and so in an ideal world, we would have a better outdoor space for um, for our program. Yeah, fighting your building seems like a theme that I'm picking up on, definitely. I'm not sure what time it is, but I do think that we might be able to do one more question, um, or we could take a quick break and, oh, that in the back. folks who um, are not sober or having a harder time or, or kind of like where people draw the line and how they navigate that in a way to keep people engaged but also safe for, for everybody there. I think we're in a tricky spot right now. Yeah. Well, we're a low barrier shelter. Um, you're not allowed to use in the dorm or in um, the actual you know, recuperative care. Um, does that mean it doesn't happen? No, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but we do have a large <laughs> outdoor space. So, you know, frequently the, the smell of pot when you're about a block away is pretty hefty. Um, thing bringing in, you know, a lot of alcohol, if you're bringing in, you know, a couple of big bottles of vodka or whatever, um, it depends on how many times you've done that and whether or not you're sloppy drunk to go with it. So, um, you know, you'll get a warning at least. And, and people, for the most part, respect that. There's a lot of people in recovery that are also there. 
We used to be a totally sober shelter, um, which worked very well for the clients there, but it didn't work well for the people that were trying to get in. So that turned around relatively quickly within about the first two years of the opening of the shelter, which opened in 2004. Um, so it still would be nice to have more of a menu in the community so that people could choose where they wanted to go and, you know, especially those that really support the sobriety, um, if that's where they're coming from. But we do our best with having a lot of um, sober support programs and try not to be too punitive in things, situations when people bring their vodka into the door. Oh, uh, so. Portland people? Any thoughts? I think the topic of harm reduction and, and how that looks in this space is probably one of the ongoing conversations that we're always having. Um, I mean, thus far today, we've never had to, you know, have like really a, a significant discharge conversation with somebody yet. We really try to work with folks. Um, who are using, and that can look in a lot of different ways. I mean, we can talk to them about med management, like are you using, because that's what you're, that's what you're used to doing to get your, your pain needs met. Um, and obviously we're in the short amount of time, we're not gonna get into the trauma of like why people use. So it's more so just kind of like maintaining them and helping them work on their medical goals here. Um, while they're using and also just offering extra support, um, monitoring folks, always checking in, talking about safe ways that they can use um, while they're in the space and how staff can support them. Um, but then there's like this line of are they, are they actually getting their medical needs met while they're there and is their use contributing to like um, them not taking care of themselves or not going down to get their meds and their wound care. Is their wound um, exacerbating due to the fact that they are using an X, Y, or Z form? So, you know, and, and we don't have the answer to that and we might not ever have the answer to that and every mm -hmm. client is drastically different and we just try to um, approach each client with that type of positive regard and, and really making sure that that they can stay here and, and, and get their medical needs met. Great. Well, with that, it is 4.01. I see that I do they have a clock on here. And um, <laughs> I will just plug that people leaving the hospital or any kind of incarceration are at greatly increased risk of overdose if they are substance users. So if you, even if you are not a harm reduction based or you're an abstinence only facility, you should think about having naloxone on you because you could save somebody's life. Just as a plug while I have the podium. And now, um, <laughs> uh, let's all, uh, thank you so much everyone here for letting us look at your videos and how you do things and thanks for your time. Not all of them, just highlighting a few of them because I mentioned earlier, since NIMARC's launch, a lot of resources have been created. A lot of time and energy and expertise went into the resource development. A lot of you have reviewed some of the resources or contributed to them. And we want to make sure you know what they are and you access them so that you're not feeling like you have to recreate the wheel every time you're wanting to do something with your medical respite program. So the first thing that I want to highlight quickly is that we have recently updated the medical respite state of the field. This is on the NIMARC website. Um, this is a really great resource for talking about what medical respite care looks like across the country. So it gives information about the number of programs across the country, what staffing looks like for programs, how programs are funded, um, what am I forgetting? Oh, uh, what type of facility a program is in. It's great information just to get a snapshot of what medical respite looks like. And when you are talking to people about medical respite care, this is good data for you to use. Screenshot this information, tag NIMARG, give credit to NIMARG, but share it with, with your partners. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight from the state of the field. First of all, this data is based on our directory information. So NIMARC, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, maintains a directory of medical respite programs. 
it is a self-reported directory. So it is entirely dependent on your community filling out a profile and submitting it to our directory. So please take some time to take a look at our directory. And if your program is missing, submit a profile. We would love to include you in our national voice around respite. Two things I want to highlight quickly that are are sort of new this year. Um, so the number of programs across the country has grown, not necessarily a surprise. And we know this number does not reflect the full amount of medical respite programs, because we know there are folks who don't know NIMARC, don't even know to submit a profile. But we are around 150-ish programs now. Just like five or six years ago, we were at like 80 programs. So this is an incredible growth over the last several years. Um, another thing that I think is pretty exciting, when we look at staffing for medical respite programs, we're getting to the point where it is common practice for peer workers to be staff of medical respite programs. And that is incredible. That is such a good practice, um, and I'm really excited about that. And so I think as you are thinking about your staffing structure, Bringing on community health workers, that's great work for medical respite care. Peer support specialists, it's great work. Um, and using that data to your advantage to advocate for more funding. The other thing that we're seeing on the rise, more programs moving into or bringing on hospice or palliative care. I think there's gonna be a lot of that over the next several years as we know our population is aging, more fragile, and there seem to be less and less resources for folks uh, for end-of-life care. And it's, we're starting to hear respite programs really consider whether or not this should be their work. The other thing we're starting to see some growth in is the number of programs who are doing family respite care. So looking at medical respite care for single parents or parents experiencing homelessness with their children, um, and the parents needing respite care or children needing respite care. So the parents or a parent are healthy and the child is recovering from surgery. We're also hearing of more programs who are taking high, women with high-risk pregnancies experiencing homelessness. It's just interesting areas of growth that we're seeing there. So again, highly encourage you to take a look at the state of the field. Um, and if you don't see that you have a profile submitted, we will find you. Um, so the NIMARC website is pretty overwhelming with resources. After our meeting today, I'm going to send you a follow-up email with links to the website and with all of the resources we've referenced over the full day. So these policy resources, the planning guide resources. Caitlin just recently did a bunch of clinical resources, adapted clinical guidelines for medical respite care for all you clinicians in the room. We have great behavioral health resources. Uh, Krista has put together some amazing housing resources. Sam did um, some case studies around staffing. We've got a lot of really incredible resources. So I want to make sure that you have access to them. If you have questions, please email us. We're happy to direct them to you. Um, one thing that Krista highlighted earlier today is our online courses. So this is new for us, but we have eight medical respite focused online courses that are free. You do have to create a login, but that's also on the NIMARC website in our learning portal. Part of the goal with these online courses is we kept hearing from medical respite programs is that they had no standard staff onboarding training. They had no specific um, outline of what they're supposed to educate staff with when they come on for medical respite programs. So several of those online courses are specifically for staff of medical respite care. What is discharge planning? What is harm reduction? What is trauma-informed care? And then there are also online courses uh, more geared towards partnerships. So how do you partner with managed care plans? How do you partner with hospitals? So highly encourage you to take those online courses best part is you get a certificate when you finish. So for everybody in the room who's motivated by gold stars, um, I feel like there's probably a lot of you. <laughs> um, I think, is there, medical respite team, is there any other resource we want to highlight? No? Okay. Okay, we'll send those out to you. This is the first year at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Conference that we have a medical respite track as part of the conference. That means Almost every session of the, of the conference, workshop session, has a workshop specifically focused on medical respite care. So we've highlighted those workshops. It should be clear in your app, most of them, but we've highlighted them on these slides. I will send these slides out after today, and we also are going to upload them into the portal on the app so you have access to them. But some really great workshops uh, 
diving deep into medical respite care. So one around operation and evaluation, thriving beyond recuperative care, which is a question we're asked all the time. What happens when people leave recuperative care? How do recuperative care programs stay connected with folks after they leave? Um, what happens when short-term medical respite care is not enough? Barbara's uh, workshop that she talked about on uh, Medicaid reimbursement, harm reduction in medical respite care, and then uh, palliative care. There's a great workshop that's gonna be on palliative care um, that's not necessarily medical respite specific, but is around this end of life, death and dying piece. Uh, you have on your table evaluations for the day. If you wouldn't mind taking just a few moments to complete that evaluation, it's really helpful for us as we're planning our trainings to get your feedback, and it's helpful for us to hear what worked well for you and what you wish we had included. Um, we always are trying to improve our resources, so if you could take the time to fill that out, that would be fantastic. The last thing that I want to remind you of is we are going to be having our reception. I don't know if I've mentioned it or not. Um, it starts at 5 o'clock, so you have just a little bit of time to go back to your room, take a break, come back down. We'll have snacks, cash bar. Remember my asterisk about the cash bar. You follow your heart on, on how you want to manage that. Just a second. Um, and then we'll be meeting up here right outside around 5, come at 5.15, come at 5.30. You do what you want. You're an adult. Um, we'll have a short program around 545, and then we'll set you free into Baltimore to eat really delicious crab cakes. Question? Um, there were no forms, but okay. if I'm not mistaken, it's on the app, right? These are not. This, this one specifically is not. So we would love for you to do a paper form. Yeah, so we'll bring them to you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's so good to be with you. We love being with this community. Our role here is to support you and to represent you in our national partnerships. So if you need help with literally anything medical respite related, you know, we have an entire medical respite team that would be thrilled to schedule a call with you. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the conference and we'll see you at five.